<laughs> Today's talk comes straight from the heart. And it just is volume. It's something that it's something that I've been thinking on a great deal of time. And I I told some folks on Wednesday night that after today, uh, either people will be inspired or I'll be looking for a new job. So, this all started from an article that I read last week. It's from The Gleaner, a newspaper published in Jamaica, which was an interview with the Reverend Bruce Southworth, the senior minister of Community Church in New York, which is one of our largest churches in the Unitarian Universalist Association. So they go through, and he's itemizing the things that he and, by assumption, Unitarian Universalists either believe or don't believe. So I want you to listen to the list, and I want you to listen to how it concludes, and just, just think on it for a minute. We reject dogma, says Southworth, while defining the term as a rigid set of principles to which every member must subscribe. Revelation is forever unfolding, <coughs> Reject, rejecting theological homeostasis, which big word to mean fixed and final revelation. In other words, revelation continues. Number three, he does not attempt to reconcile the Old and New Testaments. He negates the divinity of Jesus, which is a controversial statement, but not historically uncommon. He rejects vicarious atonement, the idea that Jesus died for the sins of others. He rejects the resurrection of the physical body, not just Jesus, but everyone. If God is pure love, he will not condemn anyone to hell for all eternity, nor would he allow the brutality and terror unleashed on his son. These views are insulting to God's perfection. Believing that God cares about you in some special way is a form of self-righteousness and hubris. It is destructive. The universe is not about you or me. He denounces Calvin's view of man's inherent evil and the concept of original sin as a denunciation of humanity. In other words, the idea that we're all born inherently <coughs> evil through what Adam and Eve did, he believes is false and that we are not inherently evil, for that view degrades what it is to be human. We are the universe, come to consciousness. We become gods and lights of the world, he says, invoking the provocative biblical pronouncement that we are gods, and there's a couple of passages referenced. The Garden of Eden, he views as an allegory and a discourse on free will. He views the nakedness of Adam and Eve as a celebration of the body's natural beauty, not as a source of shame as related in the Bible theme. He veers away from mainstream eschatology, which is the study of future things, and opines that our individuality may extinguish at death. To believe otherwise is a reflection of self-centeredness, the I syndrome. So he doesn't really think that we exist after we die. There are awful stories in the Old Testament that are unacceptable today, Southworth adds, citing the punishing the deadly injunctions against sodomy and homosexuality. So, so far there's nothing terribly surprising. We would expect statements like this from a Unitarian Universalist minister, or at least in general. But here's the final paragraph. An exponent of diverse theological disciplines, he admits to identifying with the Hindu Upanishads, but he does not see a contradiction in his role as a Christian minister. Revelation, he argues, is not exclusive to a single faith. Now that last paragraph was sort of jarring to me, and it may have just passed over your head and, and you're wondering what I'm going on about. If you consider all those things that I read off that he said, and then the story concludes calling him a Christian minister, does that not strike you as a bit odd? Especially when he says, Revelation is not exclusive to a single faith, and that he finds, or he identifies with the Hindu scriptures more than the Bible scriptures. What kind of a Christian minister could go into a Christian church and say, well, we're not the only exclusively true religion, and I'm really more of a Hindu than a Christian, but happy to be your Christian minister, 
Um, and, and then, by the way, I don't believe all these things that I read off to you. There, there might be some. Maybe some of the more progressive Christian churches could handle that, but they would be few and far between. And I thought, why does this story call him a Christian minister? He's a Unitarian Universalist, and we don't call ourselves a Christian religion. Historically, yes, we were the Christian heretics. But today, we call ourselves Unitarian Universalists. I've never really heard a Unitarian Universalist minister call him or herself a Christian minister. So I don't know if this is something he said or something that was assumed because somewhere out there in the world, the distinctives between us and Christianity have been lost or aren't getting relayed via our communications. So, I wondered, why is it in an article like this, and, and in many cases, other than this, just this article, why is it that Christianity and Unitarian Universalism still get conflated? And if you don't know what conflated means, I didn't either until a couple of years ago. It just means merged together. Why is it that we are somewhat indistinguishable? Why is it when you go into town and you tell people you go to a Unitarian Universalist church, they have no idea what we are, I mean, seriously, some people think we handle snakes. I've heard that more than once. <laughs> some people think we're moonies. Uh, people really don't know about us. And many people see church on the sign and think we're just another Christian denomination. It's a common mistake. Why is it that we're not recognized as clearly distinct? Well, perhaps it's the language we use. And I've spoken on language before, so I'm not going to repeat what I've said in the past. And if you want to hear, I did a sermon on faith and whether we should use faith language. And I did a sermon on whether we should use the word church or not. And those are on our website if you want to go back and look at those after this. I'm, I'm not, I may touch on it, but I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time going over what I've already talked about. But what got me going along this line was the skit by George Carlin many years ago. Seven things you can never say on TV. By the way, seven things I cannot say here either. But it's on YouTube if you want to watch it. He does a skit about all the dirty words that could never be on TV. And indeed, sometimes the skit is actually called the seven dirty words. And I thought, well, why don't I just do a play on that? And I'll do the seven words you can never say, dot, 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 because I'm not going to finish the sentence just yet but I will at the end of this talk. So it is true that our roots are completely Christian. We were, we are descendants of Christian heretics, people who thought outside the box, who called themselves Christians but believed differently than the official dogmas. Unitarians believed there was one God and Jesus wasn't part of the Trinity. Universalists believed no one went to hell, a loving God wouldn't do that but they still called themselves Christians. If you're watching the video series with us on Wednesday nights, you can see that in fact the early Unitarians, back when the name was first adopted in Transylvania, before they became Unitarians, simply called themselves Christians. Just the Christians who believe the right thing as opposed to the Trinity. <laughs> and so we fully acknowledge our Christian roots. But I do think that there are seven words seven words from this Christian tradition that are holding us back from evolving into the religion we can be. And I use the religion happily. That's not one of the seven words. <laughs> religion has a value to all of us as hum humans. It helps us to find truth and meaning, which is, I think is, if we had to have one purpose statement for this church, it's to help each one of us find truth and meaning in our lives and to support each other in that search. <clears throat> but having said that, I still think that there are some things we can do better and some things we're doing wrong more out of tradition than perhaps out of practicality, perhaps out of effectiveness. Um, and I'm going to encourage us to think about these things today. Even though our origins are undeniably Christian, our forefathers the people we look back on with pride and point and say, look at what these great people did to get us to where we are today. If we could magically transport them here to sit with us 
and in the case of some to translate the language so they could understand what we're saying, they would not recognize what they started has become. Okay. For instance, Hosea Ballou and John Murray, the American founders of universalism, would be appalled, truly be appalled at what we believe today uh, because they were Christians. They didn't believe in hell, but they did believe the Bible was God's word, and they built everything they taught from the Bible, and they would not be very welcoming to the atheists and the pagans and the Wiccans and the Hindus and the Muslims and the Jews and the homosexuals and all the other variations that are now commonplace in the Unitarian Universalist congregation. They would have trouble with that. They would. Same with Michael Servetus, who was executed and is often called the first Unitarian martyr, killed by the Protestants, hunted by the Catholics for daring to deny the Trinity. He would look at this church and be appalled because they are not Christian. So the people we revere, the people we honor for our history, would nonetheless probably be very uncomfortable here with what we teach today. We have evolved. We have changed, and we have changed drastically and dramatically, and we may not fully be aware of that. What we were in the early days and what we are now are perhaps more radically different than any other religion, any other denomination in this country. And we take that for granted, but if you stop and pause and think about that, that's an amazing thing it really is. So, before I go on, I want to stress this is Doug's opinion. When I speak up here, I speak as one person with an opinion. You pay me to try to prod you, to teach you, to encourage you, to motivate you, to make you think. And I can only tell you what I have concluded after all these years of study and thinking and putting myself through the exercise of writing a sermon twice a month. Mm -hmm. This is something I think is important, but I also fully understand you. You may not agree with one or more of these points, and we can talk about that during talkback. I am not making a pronouncement from Mount Sinai like Moses. I'm not a pope. Um, I don't even have a vote on the Board of Trustees. I am an advisor. You've asked me to share, and that's what I'm going to do. But I fully acknowledge this is just my opinion. I fully acknowledge I could be all wet. I fully acknowledge I could be wrong. But here's what I concluded this week. Give me some feedback. I'm sure you will. <laughs> <laughs> the first of the seven dirty words is church. And I, like I said, I did a whole sermon on the word church, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Many of us grew up in a Christian church, a fundamentalist church in many cases, and the word church and Christianity in this country are inextricably linked. It is true that other religions use this word, sometimes in order to achieve tax exemption or a form of legitimacy. But if you tell the average American, and certainly the average Tullahoman, or Manchesterite, or winchester or him, or whatever we call <laughs> people around here, that you're going to church, they assume you're going to a Christian church, not the Church of Scientology, not the Church of Satan, not the American Buddhist Church. All of these are real churches. Hard to believe that the Buddhists, with the long tradition that they have, some have actually chosen to use the word church in America. So in the USA, church pretty much equals Christian. And this word church has a variety of effects on people. Some stay away. Uh, just the other day, I was trying to get someone to come, a friend of mine, and he said, I'm really not a church person. <laughs> but it's on the sign! <laughs> I'm really not a minister. I mean, I am, technically, but not like the other... Well, we'll get to that later. So there are people who stay away, and conversely, there are people who come because the word church makes it feel more welcoming. I, I fully understand that. I think probably it weighs more heavily on those who might come if it didn't say church than those who come because it says church. But I haven't done a scientific analysis of this. I do know that we have uh, folks who don't want to join our congregation because of the word church. Um, people who otherwise are fully participatory and backbones of the congregation, but the word church is an issue. 
Um, and it was very hard for me to come here. I've shared that story many times. I swore I would never go to church again after leaving fundamentalism. And it was very scary. And I hear that a lot from visitors, how they have to work up their courage to come here the first time. They don't know what to expect. They don't want to go to a church. They don't want to be preached at. They don't want to be told what to think. And, and, and yet, supposedly, we're different, but they're still afraid. And I've heard that story many times to people coming here, more often than not. So it happens. And I don't know if it's the word church, or if it's Unitarian Universalist, or if it's just the unknown, I don't know. But some people have specifically said, I didn't want to go to a church again, but I worked up the courage to do so. In my opinion, we should change the name. I've said this before, it was not terribly well received, and I'm, I'm not going to make this my mark. But in my opinion, we should come up with something else. To show a face to the world that we're different. Not because there's anything wrong with our tradition, but just to be a little more distinctive, a little more separate us from the hundred other churches in Tullahoma. Something different. If you see a sign that says a mosque or synagogue or temple, you don't assume those are churches. You know they're not churches. They have distinctive names for something different. If we are something different, from the other 99 churches in this town, why not have a different name? That's all I'm going to say on that. <laughs> the next dirty word is minister, which is highly ironic, because that's what I am. And here's why. And first of all, this is not something we can change locally. This is a Unitarian Universalist thing. It is the official designation they use. It is the way they honor their leaders, or title their leaders, or whatever you want to call it. And so this is a change that has to come from much higher up than our congregation. But here's my logic. Throughout history, as long as there have been religions, there has been this division between the priestly class and the laity, or the commoners, or the non-priests, the non-religious people, the less holy people, the people less close to God. There's always been that division. It's a power thing. The priests spoke for God. They knew the Word of God. They had access to the Word of God. The common people didn't. They didn't have a Bible they could take home. Most of them couldn't even read in the early days. So they believed what the priests told them. Sometimes these priests had even more powers. They could conduct the actual sacrifices you had to make to atone for your evil. And so you would give the animal to the priest, and the priest would do the actual sacrificing. They interceded. They were the go-between, between you and God. Some could forgive your sins. Some could determine your ultimate fate and condemn you to hell for all eternity. Now this seems rather silly now to our highly educated 21st century minds, and yet the division between clergy and laity remains today. If you go to any significant Unitarian Universalist event, like General Assembly or a regional meeting or an ordination, you will see something called the procession of ministers. All the ministers put on their robes, their stoles, they enter to music, the hymn is played, they sit in the front rows, the rows of honor. Oftentimes there's a whole service just for them to honor what they do. And, you know, that's not bad that you're thanking people for serving as ministers. But there's also a separation when you do that, because plenty of other people devote their hearts and souls to congregations, and they're not ministers. The RE directors, the religious education directors, have been told specifically, you will not robe, you will not wear a soul, and you will not protest with us, because you are not ordained. But they do this full time too. They're just not ministers. And then there's the people in the congregation who work hard all the time to keep things afloat. Board members, presidents of the board, and the other people who just do the work behind the scenes. And there are a lot in this congregation. Everyone, if you don't know, you need to know that Lucy over here is like the secret to our success because she keeps everything going without a word, without a complaint. And then other people too, not just Lucy, lots of you come in and devote lots of time. 
No money, no acknowledgement, you just do what needs to be done to keep this place going. Well, guess what? We are all ministry. You just happen to pay me to come up with a sermon twice a month and to do some other stuff to be a face to the community and to be the first one that gets called when people need help. And that's great, but that doesn't make me anything special, and it sure doesn't mean I should be distinguished from you in any particular way. I don't believe that. I think those divisions between ministers and the others is a dangerous one, and I don't really like it. I mean, I, I don't, don't get me wrong. I'm thrilled that you ordained me. I appreciate that to the core of my existence. I don't want there to be a feeling that I'm somehow different or special because of it. It's a position you gave me and I'm deeply honored. But the word minister carries lots of different connotations for different people. If I go out in the community and I say to someone who doesn't know me, I'm a minister, immediately assumptions are made. They immediately assume, almost without exception, that I am a Christian minister because the Christians use that title. And it's almost gotten to where I say I'm a minister, but I'm not a Christian minister. I'm a Unitarian Universalist minister. And they go, what's that? Hopefully, we can have a conversation. But I really hate just leaving people with an assumption. I know, almost certainly know they're making. And by the way, when I say I'm a minister, the people who would probably most enjoy this church are probably the people who immediately throw up the defenses because they don't go to church. And they're the others. Or the atheists and the agnostics, or the backsliders, or the pagans, or whatever. And I'm saying, hi, I'm a minister. So I have to immediately try to clarify that. And I imagine other Unitarian Universalists have this same issue. We need something different. And again, I don't think it's ever going to happen, but we really need a different title. If someone goes out and says they're a rabbi, or a Zen master, or an imam, suddenly you know that's associated with something else. Those religions have a distinctive title. We should have a distinctive title. Something that says we are different, so there's no confusion, because we are Unitarian Universalists, and we are different. Dirty word number three is a word I use all the time out of habit. I use it here all the time, and it's worship. Now, why would I have an issue with worship? Well, let's look at what Webster's defines worship as. The act of showing respect or love for a god, especially by praying with other people who believe in the same god. <coughs> the act of worshiping god or a god. Well, we don't really do that here. That's not to say people don't believe in god, because of course many of you do. But we don't do corporate worship where we all worship together a particular God and pray to a particular God. Now there is another definition, a secondary definition that makes a lot more sense, a form of religious practice <coughs> with its creed and ritual. Well, we don't have the creed, but we do have a bit of a ritual. We like the chalice, we do our joys and concerns, we sing a hymn, uh, you know, we share with each other, we give our announcements, we have a sermon, what they like to call at seminary the sermon sandwich, hymn, sermon, him. Sermon sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> but no oh, BLT? Okay. <laughs> so technically you could call it a worship service, but but again, considering we're sort of half of the secondary definition, maybe there's a better thing to call it just a service, for instance. Our next dirty word and this is the one that's really going to get people hackled up. So listen, remember, hey, it's just my opinion. And B, there is a reason. The word is spirituality. Now, no? <laughs> you don't get to side. You don't get to side yet. You got to hear what I say first. Then you can side. Here's why. And I even wrote down here. It's probably the one that will have the most disagreement. Almost like I'm psychic. The word, here's, here's, here's the issue. The word spiritual assumes that there's a dichotomy, a division between the physical and the spiritual, between secular and religious or spiritual, between the intellect and the soul or the intellect and the spirit. 
It assumes that we have a soul and a physical body and the two are separate. And when we come here, often people will say, I want to hear a talk of a spiritual nature. But what does that actually mean? Now, if you think those assumptions are wrong, and that if you use the word spiritual, it doesn't assume those things, fair enough. Maybe you don't. I think that word does sort of create some kind of a division. For instance, last week, the speaker who came here talked about surveying. And it was a very interesting talk. But there was some concern that it was not a spiritual discussion. And maybe you were put off by the topic. Maybe you didn't come because the topic didn't seem spiritual to you. I don't know. Um, but what does it have to do with church? Why are we hearing this on a Sunday morning? But if we consider that how we live is the center of our teaching here, and if searching for truth and meaning is, is really our mission, then maybe listening to different aspects of how people live their lives and what's important to them is spiritual. Maybe it is appropriate in a way we hadn't thought of because we've got this artificial dichotomy in our head that we come here and we hear spiritual things. And then if you want to hear about surveying, you do it somewhere else. And so that, that's not appropriate here because it's not and we have a living example right here. You know, Chucky was invited to speak here about quilting. And quilting is not generally considered a spiritual topic. But she came, she showed her quilt, she fell in love with the church and has become a regular member, as has Barbara, because we had a talk here about quilts. And by no stretch of the imagination is talking about quilts a spiritual topic, but it is, I think, an appropriate topic for what we do here. You may disagree, but look at the benefits. It's an interesting idea that our talks here can be about our lives and not always have to be about spiritual things, whatever that means. So that's why I think the word spiritual sometimes gets in the way. And another word closely tied to spiritual is the word soul. Because a soul is generally thought of as the part of us that lives on after our physical body is dead. It assumes that there's a part of you that actually exists that doesn't require your brain to function. And this may be true. I don't know if it's true or not. It's something fascinating to study. And scientists are studying this. And it does intrigue us that there's a possibility that part of us does continue. It is far from an established fact. At this point, it's, in a hy it's a hypothesis, not a certainty. And is it something that you must include in your talks on Sunday? Is it something that has to be an assumption for something to be religious that there is a soul? So I don't know that that's a word we use a whole lot here, but we do use it. And again, sometimes perhaps more of a hindrance than a help. The final two words are also paired together. Sermon and preach. And I use both of these with great regularity. <laughs> when I was at seminary, I took a class on preaching. And this was at a Unitarian Universalist seminary. I took it from the esteemed Bill Schultz, who was a former president of the UUA for eight years. He's the executive, or was the executive director of Amnesty International, and he's currently the UU Service Committee president. As UUs go, he is as close to a pope as you've got. No one, I dare say, is more respected or has put more of his or her life into Unitarian Universalism and still holds the position today than he does. And he told us, in no uncertain terms, that you give sermons, not talk not lectures. You give sermons and you preach. And that was pretty much it. <laughs> it wasn't open for discussion. You preach, you preach sermons. That's what we do. End of discussion. Well, if we go back to Webster's Dictionary, <laughs> which has been around quite a while, preach, to deliver a sermon or to urge the acceptance or abandonment of an idea or a course of action specifically to exhort, 
in an officious or tiresome manner. Yeah. <laughs> if, I hope we can avoid that tiresome part. Me too. And I may be officious on occasion, I try not to be, but I certainly try not to be tiresome. So, that's what preaching means according to Webster's. And a sermon is a religious discourse delivered in public, usually by a clergyman, I guess they don't have clergy women in Webster's, <laughs> as part of a worship service. So now we're back to the worship service thing, so the words all sort of swirl around together. And I've bought into this for several years. I've always said I give sermons. And I joke around when you come up here and speak, when it's your turn, when Casey or Linda has twisted your arm and you get up here, I say, it's your turn to preach. You're giving a sermon. And people sort of, I don't give sermons. Sure you do. You're up there at the pulpit, aren't you? You're giving a sermon. Uh, but once again, as I want to do, I evolve and change too. And over time, over the last year, I think I've, I like the word talk better. And there's actually a, a tradition, a non-Christian tradition to the word talk. It's the uh, Buddhist tradition, where they don't give sermons. They give what's called a Dharma talk. And I like that. I like talk. It sounds less preachy, less officious, less tiresome, <laughs> less holier than thou, or less I'm speaking from on high because I'm the minister and down to the laity. Um, and rather just we're going to get together and talk which I really think is what we do here, and I like that. So those are seven words. It was somewhat of an artificial construct using George Carlin as a springboard to make me write my sermon, because you know how much I love having to sit down and think of something new every couple weeks. <sighs> you know I love you because I would never do this just for the fun of it. <laughs> so here's how I would finish that sentence. The seven words you can never say if we want Unitarian Universalism to evolve into what it can be. I think we have a great opportunity to change with the future and to become a religion that still has relevance. Our history must never be ignored. That's why we watch that video series on Wednesday sometimes. Because the history of who we were in the past and how we got to where we are today is very important. But we do evolve. We do change over time. And I do believe that we need to shed these last vestiges of Protestant Christianity and be something different. We are no longer the heretic, heretical branch of Christianity. We have evolved and changed beyond that. We are something else entirely. I believe that to the very core of my existence. And I think most of you do too. We are a unique religion that understands and expects that our members will find meaningful value in their lives in a large variety of sources, both religious and philosophical, both spiritual and secular. And maybe there should be no division between that spiritual and secular. We find meaning in existence. We find meaning in life, period. We strive to find unity in our discussions and our sharing of ideas and we hopefully come to each encounter with the honest belief that we might be wrong. And boy, am I going to have that belief when we get into our discussion circle today. Because I know some of you disagree with me, and that's good. Because heaven forbid we would all be mindless clones of each other. But I have shared what's on my heart, what I've been thinking about. Unitarian Universalism is in and of itself different. It started out as a Christian heretical movement, but we are different now. And not only by our actions, not only by what we do here on Sundays and Wednesday nights and in the community, but also in the very words we use. I think, I urge, I exhort you, and I dare say I preach, that we should be clearly and unequivocally unique. Some of these changes I can make myself in the language that I use whether I call what I do here giving a talk or preaching a sermon. Others have to be done by the association itself, if we would ever use a word other than minister. And in between, there's the things that we can only do as a congregation, like change the sign out front and not have the word church on it. 
if that's what you want to do, because it's, it's your choice, not mine. I'm merely giving you my opinion. But I think there's some validity in that possibility. My voice is but one voice in a democratic congregation. One of our founding principles is that we make our decisions democratically. So why did I do this talk? I said it, something was weighing on my heart. I've been thinking a lot about it. Well, what I want you to do right now, for a moment, is look around at each other. Just take a moment and look around at the folks sitting here, to your left and your right, in front of you and behind you. Just take a look around. <laughs> Now, the vast majority of the people you see are over 50 years old. There are not a lot of young people here. There are some, and thank goodness for them. Especially <laughs> why your dad just pointed at <laughs> <laughs> Liberal and mainline Protestantism is in serious decline. I hear this when I visit with my fellow ministers, I read about it in various publications, I heard about it at seminary. Numbers are going down. Even the fundamentalist churches where you hear that they're growing, well, not so much anymore. They're declining at a slower rate, but they are declining too. And we are barely treading water ourselves as Unitarian Universalists. We've never been that large to begin with. And our numbers are remaining steady, but in relation to the overall population, we're actually going down a little bit, too. Now, I know that the people who come here like coming here. They say so all the time. They share it, and we have great, meaningful community here. And while I can say that we aren't really like a typical church, we still meet on Sunday mornings, we have a minister, we have church in our name, the service format is pretty much standard Protestant church format. We have a hymnal. You know, if it wasn't for the things that we were actually saying, we would be fitting nicely into the Christian Protestant mold of a Sunday morning service. And I think it's possible, indeed I know in some cases, that there are people who don't come here because of that. And I think that we should change. I think this because we want Unitarian Universalists to have a strong, abiding voice in Tullahoma. We want a younger generation to be here in 20, 30, 40 years. We want the Unitarian Universalist congregation to exist and have an influence in this area to be that bastion of free thought <coughs> where people can come and be who they are and find truth and meaning without fear without coercion. And we want that younger generation to be eager to come in here, know that this is something different, because I think something different is what we need in this country, it's what we need in this community, and it's what's going to be relevant over the next 50, 100 years. The same old, same old isn't going to work. The demographics already prove that. And we are unique but we need to put that uniqueness out there. Hanging on to Protestant traditions, in my mind, is a mistake. And in this case, it's the, the language of Protestantism. And it is our tradition. I don't poo-poo that. I mean, what we were in the past is important to what we are today. And even though people like John Murray and Hosea Ballou and Michael Cavitas would not recognize us and would not be comfortable here. They are still the men who helped us to get to where we are today, to where we can be free. And so we never, never, never denigrate that. But I do think the evolution that we have gone through in the past has been dramatic, and I think the evolution needs to continue. And I'd like to see us at least do some of that on our own. So there is a lot to talk about. There's a lot to think about. Decisions aren't going to be made today. That wasn't the point of this talk. But I really hope that this is the beginning of a serious evaluation of who we are, how we present ourselves in the community, where we hope to be in the future, and how we hope to remain relevant, how we hope to continue to exist, to be able to support people. Because, you know, you can't have a growth plan that says, Every time our minister retires, we hope somebody else with a pension comes in decides
decide to go to seminary and become a minister. Um, that's not a good survival strategy. So, what do we do in the future? How do we maintain our presence here? How do we help the people in this community to give them this place they can come to? I look forward to your thoughts during the discussion circle. Thank you so much for coming and listening. And just remember, everything I said here, I say out of love and care and concern for each and every one of you.